Captain Tachyon, Croy, Prince, and Jack Braun, Captain Flint, Brain Trust, Earl Sanderson, Silver Helix, Chop Chop, Young Troll, Stopwatch, Will and Wisp, Turtle, and Xavier Desmond. All right, welcome to the card table. Um, today, book six, um, we've got another ball on the cover, I believe his last, and then this is the Tim Truman cover. Uh, so we got two paperbacks. That's really all I've got for this one. As as we get more into the series, there's fewer reprints uh, available, and certainly fewer than I have. Um, I think uh, these were like the only two for quite a quite a bit of time, and then eventually. Um, oh no, there's I'm sorry, there's the hardcover, which I don't have. And uh, I'll probably talk a little bit about Volume Seven, where this is literally the only copy of Volume Seven I have, the only edition, um, where. Uh, Whereas I have so very many of those first five, for whatever reason, um, a lot of uh, if you look if you look back at like some of the original, well, actually even even later later uh, runs of wild cards, uh, like these British UK editions stop. I'm pretty sure they stop at this one. I don't think there is anything for seven and beyond. Um, same with the Sci-Fi Club exclusive hardcovers. I don't think they go beyond six. Uh, I think iBooks. When they were when they were putting them all out, I think they stopped at six. Uh, it seemed like it was like a cursed number for a while. I remember when Tor first came out with Volume Six, it was like, and thankfully Tor has gone on to to put out new editions of seven through twelve and and uh, sixteen through twenty nine as well. So, uh, still waiting on those Card Shark three, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. So I'm still I'm still crossing my fingers that soon we'll have we'll live in a world where every single Wild Cards book. Every single Wild Cards book is in print. Yeah, like I say, fingers crossed. But in the meantime, um, the other thing about the iBooks edition of this, uh, I, I, I've mentioned in the previous videos about how the um, the iBooks editions always used these same Brian Bolland illustrations. Maybe that's why iBooks stopped. They ran out of Brian Bolland artwork after six. But um, I mentioned that the first five have those afterwards by uh, George Martin, George R. R. Martin. Um, Kind of giving a little bit of behind the scenes about about the books, which uh, is definitely candy to a, a fan like me. Sadly, the iBooks edition of Volume Six doesn't have an afterward, so which makes me especially sad because these the the six and seven kind of combined uh, constitute a real a real high point for me personally. I think these are really great books, and uh, in many ways are almost really one book uh, in kind of two halves. Um, which I can talk about presently. So the idea, the, these are another, uh, what they call the braided narratives, where it's, uh, where you're following several point of view characters uh, throughout one very truly novelistic story, um, in the sense that you're just cutting, you know, all the characters appear at the start and, and you follow them right through to the end, as opposed to story, then a story, then a story, with a different character each time. And this one, uh, so this one, five authors, one, two, yeah, <laughs> you think I remember this by now? Five authors, uh, six characters, because Vic Milan writes two. Uh, so you've got Stephen Lee writing uh, Puppet Man, Victor Milan writing two characters, uh, Sarah Morgenstern and Mac the Knife, Mackie Messer, Walton si Walton Simons writing Demise, Melinda Snodgrass writing Tachyon, and Walter John Williams writing Golden Boy. And then this one uh, is only uh, two authors uh, switching it, switching it up back and forth. George R. R. Martin writing the character of Jay Aykroyd, and then John Joseph Miller writing the character of um, Yeoman. Obviously, it's... <laughs> I don't know how obvious it is to anyone just re hearing me rattle off those names, but uh, no repeats of author or characters in these two. And that's the, re the reason for that is because originally it was one big book, one large manuscript, following all eight characters written by all seven authors combined. And then um, it was decided by the publishers, I believe, Bantam. And I don't remember how exactly I know this because it isn't, <laughs> there is no afterward. Um, so I don't remember how I know this, but I do. Um, yeah, when <laughs> I can't cite my sources on this one, I'm sorry. But somewhere in a blog or an essay somewhere, George R.R. R. Martin or Melinda Snodgrass have talked about this, that it was going to be one book. And at the time, it wasn't considered cost effective. It would have been about... Uh, assuming it would have been this size, it would have been about this thick, 700 pages or so. Uh, nowadays, um, <laughs> when when every Ice and Fire book is, uh, what is the most recent one, like a thousand pages or something, and I think he's been saying recently on his blog that the next Ice and Fire book will be 
even longer, the longest one yet. So these days, it's uh, that would actually be a plus. And I remember them talking at one point when they were uh, talking about doing the, the tour reprints. Uh, I feel like there was talk. I think it was Melinda Snodgrass on her vlog. Um, and it might have just been her talking or, or thinking out loud. I don't know that it was ever seriously considered. I'm not sure. But she was talking about maybe when they did the tour editions, they would uh, put kind of stitch these back together and make it one big book as it originally was conceived. But there was never any official note, notice of anything like that. But uh, I always I always thought it would have been a cool way to sort of <laughs> they sort of have been finding ways to get fans to to rebuy these books, usually by adding new stories. So in this case, that would have been a good way to get someone like me to to rebuy these two if they had uh, made it one gigantic omnibus sort of edition of these two books. Maybe they'll still do it. Um, it would be kind of neat if they did that at some point. Um, I thought about doing it myself as like a fan edit. Um, but that would be, uh, I'm not exactly sure how I would go about it. So uh, I've never actually <laughs> actually bothered to do it. Uh, but as far as like how they went about it, um, the book, each book is uh, exactly the same in structure in the sense that it's eight chapters and it's set over eight days in July of 1988 during the Democratic National Convention, uh, the real Democratic National Convention. Uh, I went ahead and, and read a bit about it and uh, it says something, uh, the there's a Wikipedia article about it. I think it only lasted like four days or something or three days. It didn't last a whole week, uh, at least not according to the internet. But in Wildcard's world, it did. So eight chapters. So each book has is exactly the same in that sense that chapter one is... Uh, let's, let's go ahead and check it out, shall we? July 8th, Monday, July 18th, 1988, chapter one. And then if you open this one, it's chapter one, Monday, July 18th, 1988. And of course, the reason for that is because originally it was one book. And so instead, they just they took... Uh, the the J. Aykroyd and Yeoman threads and made them their own novel. Um, what that means in practice is um, that there are a lot of loose ends left over in this one, very deliberately. Um, I saw I saw a review somewhere where they talked about how Seven uh, resolved some danglers from this one. They read they wrote it in such a way as if to say that like the writers screwed up and forgot to resolve some stuff, so they had to really quickly write this one, which seems like a dumb thing to assume. <laughs> Maybe I'm reading too much into that review. This one is mostly set in Atlanta during the Democratic National Convention. This one is mostly set in New York, uh, where a particular fan favorite character, um, I never know exactly how spoilery to get in these things. I mean, it says right on the back who it is, <laughs> but she's discovered dead at the beginning of this one, um, which means, of course, she's actually also, uh, they talk about how she was discovered dead at the beginning of this one, too, since they're set simultaneously. So um, uh, this one tells you right in the very first couple pages that, uh, I guess I'll just say it, Chrysalis is the character. Uh, Chrysalis uh, was discovered dead in New York. And then, of course, the book uh, goes on to be about the Democratic National Convention, and they never really come... They, they mention it here or there that about Chrysalis being dead, um, and they don't know who did it. And then you get to the end of the book, and you still don't know who did it. So uh, anyone who <laughs> finished this book and was like, wait a minute... Um, they had to wait for this one. Uh, they probably, I think they came out pretty pretty close to each other. I think they both came out in 1990. It does kind of work, though. Uh, it's interesting, and I don't know how much... Uh, I've never read much or seen much in terms of behind-the-scenes uh, dishing, in terms of how much was changed. Like, if they, like once they knew that these two threads were going to comprise a book all of their own, if they were expanded at all. Because uh, certainly, I mean, they're almost equally thick, but this book is about literally six different characters, and this one is only about two. So was it always the case that um, these two characters comprised a whole bunch of the of the composite? Or did they say, oh, now that we're making these two their own book, we have to flesh it out, make it a little longer? That's one of those questions I'd love to ask, um, because I have no idea. And I don't know, um, yeah, I don't know if any other changes were made. Um, to when when they knew that these two threads were going to comprise a book all by themselves, uh, no clue. Um, so <laughs> I guess that ends the behind the scenes portion because um, I'm just a fan. I, I, I absorb what tidbits I can uh, hungry hungrily, but uh, ultimately I don't really know uh, what was going on. <laughs> um, but I'm always fascinated to learn more. So maybe maybe uh, hey maybe someone maybe one of the authors will comment. Uh, and, uh, and tell me more. Or, as always, I put, in, I put out the call if you want to uh, 
be if we want to make this a, a YouTube channel uh, for uh, a truly, truly the greatest, uh, <laughs> truly the greatest wild cards YouTube channel uh, that exists on the internet, as if as if there's a whole bunch competing. But um, if we want to make this the greatest, then we got to get some author interviews. So uh, I'll put out the call once again. Come on out. Uh, Walter John Williams and, and Melinda Snodgrass <laughs> and Walton Simons and Stephen Lee, even though I mispronounce your name constantly. Uh, come on, come on. Certainly there's a lot of merit to the fact that that the, the storylines were, were separated. Uh, this one becomes very much sort of, uh, again, it's always sci-fi superheroes as the sort of umbrella genre for all these books. But as I've mentioned before, each book kind of uh, has elements of other genres. This one is very much like a uh, what I would call a political thriller, uh, again, through that superhero sci-fi lens. But um, at one point they named drop the Manchurian Candidate, and I always feel like this is sort of like uh, the wild cards, wild cards counterpart to that, to Manchurian Candidate, where with, with this sort of like superhuman mind control elements, um, which I think is why they've named drop it in the book to sort of lampshade that. But with Puppet Man, of course, Greg Hartman, who announced his candidacy for presidency, uh, candidacy for uh, president in in the previous book set in 1987. Uh, and then this one becomes kind of this sort of hard-boiled uh, detective noir story, you know, solving this one grisly murder that happened in Jokertown. Um, you know, so very grisly on the streets of of the of mutated New York City, you know, whereas this one is more, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, got, it's got a sort of, there's a sort of overall sense of, um, a cleaner environment, uh, or uh, at least uh, at least the facade. Uh, you know, a lot of the scenes take place in these uh, big, beautiful hotels, uh, mainly the, you know, the main hotel in Atlanta, where the where the convention is being, where the Democratic convention is taking place. So yeah, ultimately they they do, each book that ends up taking on its own sort of distinct character, um, um, which probably speaks a little bit to why they they ultimately decided not to uh, combine them for the for the tour reissues. So if you get the tour reissues, it's still uh, very much just volume six and volume seven. So moving on to a bit of the story of volume six, um, it's it's a lot of stuff that's been set up in the previous book. There's a there's a one year jump. Um, I always like to talk about <laughs> where we are in sort of the wild cards timeline. We ended the the previous book in in August of eighty seven or thereabouts, summer of eighty seven. This one starts in summer of eighty eight, so a year has gone by, and now um, the presidential race is heating up. Leo Barnett is. Uh, is a sort of foil, um, ultimately a bit of a red herring because he's sort of like the whatever what any wild card believes is the villain, the guy who, if he's president, he has promised that he would uh, potentially uh, want to quarantine wild cards victims or wild card survivors or or however you want to call it, um, uh, or just just wild cards. As, as in the parlance within the world of the book, someone who has the wild card virus is just a wild card. So to wild cards, Leo Burnett seems like the horrible candidate, whereas Greg Hartman is the pro wild card candidate. And of course, we readers know that he would actually be the far worse candidate because he's actually this secretly the most uh, the most evil man in the wild cards universe. Uh, they're they're sort of quintessential, most horrible archetypal villain, and um, and that's that's the overall arc of it. Uh, interesting. Um, element of this one, to me anyway, is that there's, if you look at the, the POV characters, of which there are six, um, three of them are actually villains, uh, a full half of the six, which wasn't really the case with volume three. So that, that gives this, this book uh, kind of a, a unique, interesting energy where you've got Tachyon and Golden Boy and Sarah Morgenstern are sort of your heroes. Um, Sarah Morgenstern being a gnat, who also at this point in the, in the saga has kind of <laughs> is a little bit uh, emotionally impaired or uh, she's just had her mind really messed with by Puppet Man so much that she's a bit of a, an emotional wreck and she has no superpowers. So you're really down to sort of two superhero characters who need to sort of save the day, which is just Tachyon and Golden Boy. Meanwhile, there are three POV villains, Pu Puppet Man himself, Demise, who's been hired by Chrysalis to kill Hartman because she's one of the people, she's one of the few wild cards who knows the truth, one of the few people who knows the truth. And then you've got Mac, who was introduced in volume four, uh, just a kind of crazed, insane uh, ace assassin who uh, is 
in Puppet Man's employ, but also has a bit of a, um, not an Oedipal complex. I'm not sure what exactly it is, but he's imprinted on Hartman a little bit uh, in a, in a, uh, in various ways, I guess, <laughs> without getting too too detailed into that. So, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, but he's uh, an ace killer. His power is uh, vibrational in nature. <laughs> so he can he can vibrate such that he can uh, phase through walls. They use phase. That's a X-Menism. But, um, but he can also sort of vibrate his hands to the point where they can slice through things. So his hands become knives, hence Mac the Knife. Um, and so... Uh, uh, you've actually got two, basically two killers, like where basically Mackie is an assassin, Demise is an assassin. So two out of the six, so literally a third of the characters in this book uh, are just hired killers. I feel like it's got to be kind of rare, a political thriller where there are, is not one, but two uh, murderers. And really, Puppet Man, even though his own hands are clean, essentially <laughs> is a third. Uh, so three different murderers running around. Um, with only two heroes to combat them, both of whom are for various reasons. Uh, Jack, sort of because because of his sort of self-hatred, and uh, which manifests in lack of confidence and alcoholism. And Tachyon, who uh, is also at a kind of a low ebb. Uh, both of them uh, are uh, somewhat ineffectual as heroes. They wouldn't necessarily be the two that you'd pick uh, to sort of save save America. Uh, which is sort of what the stakes are in this book. Uh, so it creates, it creates a really interesting energy, and, and Sarah Morgenstern fits in that too. I mean, basically all three of the protagonists are pretty pretty compromised and pretty uh, uh, lacking in effectiveness, at least at the start, or, or uh, potentially they seem like maybe they're not going to be up to the challenge. The, the whole character and the energy of this one uh, is good. I mean, oh, and I guess I should, the other element of Tachyon and Golden Boy that makes them potentially uh, not up to the challenge is simply that they don't know <laughs> that Puppet Man, uh, that Greg Hartman is evil. Uh, Tachyon is sort of told that Greg Hartman is and refuses to believe it. And Jack is just kind of completely naive and in the dark about it. It's a book where right from the start, it seems like the villains are way more effective than the heroes. Um, and uh, that, that creates just a, a consistently entertaining uh, energy to this one. Um, and there's also a lot of, there's a lot of political machinations and uh, like I say, red herrings and, and uh, uh, some interesting character dynamics that show up in terms of, uh, for example, um, Tachyon becomes involved with the, the daughter of uh, the woman he loved back in the forties, Blythe Van Rensselaer. Um, her, her daughter, uh, Fleur von Rensselaer. Another interesting element of this book is that they really, they really, really don't bother with any kind of uh, uh, avatars or aliases. I think I mentioned in the past that, uh, like Jim Morrison, is not is in these books, but he's not called Jim Morrison because he's just a little too. Uh, they take a little, a few too many liberties for that to be possible, so they call him Tom Douglas. Um, later books have a, a, a Donald Trump avatar called Duncan Towers. But in this book, I mean, everyone's just themselves. And sometimes, I, I, I guess if I understand correctly, you can do that as long as the portrayal is not in some way uh, unflattering or, or libelous. Um, and so since all the characters, even though it's fictional versions of them, they, they sort of don't really act out of character. And I guess that's why they figure it's fine. Um, but yes, yeah, so you've got, um, it's funny to see some of the names dropped, uh, you know, even, I mean, uh, even even uh, people who uh, well, thirteen year old me reading these in or twelve year old me or thirteen year old me reading these in in nineteen ninety or ninety one, the names meant nothing to me. It's fun when you go back and read this uh, and see those names. You know, uh, Dukakis, of course, because he was actually the, the Democratic candidate in eighty eight. George Bush, of course, the Republican candidate. But uh, you know, Al Gore's name is dropped. Joe Biden. Um, and uh, there's something there's something a little surreal about it sometimes, uh, but part of, another thing I enjoy about the book. And then uh, Jesse Jackson is the one that I always think of as like, wow, Jesse Jackson is like a supporting character in this book. <laughs> like he, they give him a lot of dialogue. He's just uh, uh, he's a, he's a guy in there. It's like, did he ever read this book? Did they did they have to check with uh, a lawyer with that? Because uh, boy, Jesse Jackson does a lot of stuff in this book. Um, I, um, <laughs> I guess I don't say that in a positive or negative way. It's just a, an interesting facet.
well, it is positive in the sense that it kind of grounds it in, in this sort of weird quasi-reality, um, you know, really uh, plays up that sort of notion of this being a, a true alternate history and all that. Meanwhile, uh, Volume 7 is uh, uh, very, very good. Um, uh, George R. R. Martin and George, John Joseph Miller, a uh, great, great pair, uh, work really well together. Uh, Jay Aykroyd up to this point, uh, the major Jay Aykroyd story was in Volume 3, where he really is one of the standout characters, I think. He's not a POV character in that one, but he's just so darned and darned enjoyable. Uh, that, uh, um, and again, this is another of those behind-the-scenes things that I'd love to know. Like, at what point did, did Martin sort of look at that character and say, uh, this guy is a lead. we got to bump him up from, from supporting character to lead as soon as possible. Uh, it's one of those things I'd love to know, and I don't, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, this is a great, uh, my friend John, who introduced me to these books, this is the first book he ever, this is the first Wild Cards book he ever got. Uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it was just a, a, a birthday present or something or um, from, from someone who just knew that he liked sci-fi and genre fiction and uh, thought, I guess, just thought this looked interesting and gave it to him. Um, and uh, <laughs> his life was changed. And and mine was too. I think both of us, after reading this book, became a huge fan of this, um, if it can be called a genre of its own, um, of the sort of, uh, I, I guess it is a subgenre of its own. But the the sort of the the the, the wisecracking private eye, but in a in a sci-fi setting, um, a la Blade Runner strikes me as the most obvious and most uh, famous example. Um, there was a made uh, it was like a made for tv movie called cast a deadly spell i want to say um that i remember john being a fan of which was a private eye obviously blade runner is is kind of that uh, uh cyberpunky um you know it's a private eye in a world where there are replicants and and uh future tech um in this case it's a private eye in a world of superhumans cast a deadly spell was this uh, made for hbo thing as i recall about a private eye in a, in a world of magic where, where spells and witches and warlocks all exist and uh, john, john was a fan of all three so uh there that became uh, <laughs> a favorite a favorite subgenre the 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 private eye genre linked with um something else um carrie vaughn who uh, uh was a fan of the books uh Whenever she was growing up, somewhere in parallel to me and John, she was uh, reading these books and enjoying them. And she, uh, coincidentally or perhaps not, she posted recently on Facebook. Well, not recently. She posted on Facebook at one point about Cast a Deadly Spell. I remember that. And just thinking, hey, that's that that strikes a spark. <laughs> uh, maybe there's something to that. Maybe uh, a lot of Wild Cards fans uh, were were inspired by this book and Jay Aykroyd uh, to dig uh, any story where a private eye exists in a in a fantasy world. There's a digression for you, but yeah, the, there is something incredibly enjoyable about the, the the sort of that seeing that archetype, the wisecracking private eye archetype, wandering through this world of of mutants and uh, um, you know he's got these you know he he like knows everybody like you know. There on the corner was the, I mean, some of them are familiar Wild Cards characters like Jude the Walrus, the news vendor, who's a, seems to be a, a joker, who's an anthropomorphic walrus. There on the corner was Jube, you know, and uh, his contact on the police force is uh, Mole Man or uh, Sergeant Mole, uh, who's uh, another another kind of animalist, uh, uh, anthropomorphic animal style joker. Uh, and yeah, that. <laughs> I don't know how well I'm conveying it just by talking about it, but there's a great there's a great energy to the book as this guy just kind of wanders and you know you can imagine him in his trench coat kind of wandering the the grimy streets of New York City, um, checking in with his informants or, or uh, you know chasing down leads. Um, but every informant and every lead involves some kind of weird creature uh, or or you know human, but. Uh, someone who looks like some sort of strange creature or, or has some sort of debilitating, uh, <laughs> maybe it's not fun. Maybe the fun is the wrong word to describe some of it. Uh, you know, one of the characters is called stigmata where he's constantly bleeding from, uh, stigmata wounds. Um, which I guess is a little dark when you think about it. Um, 
but in practice it all just kind of feels like part of that just like a, a again kind of a mutated version of that uh that noir style uh you know noir seen through this lens of of uh mutation and just kind of exaggerating some of the features of noir that really were already there um those kind of harsh angles and, and uh dark corners um and uh, just sort of taking taking a lot of the that aesthetic and just kind of pushing it in a slightly <laughs> slightly abstracted or or you know um extra human uh direction uh you know like film noir meets i don't know german abstraction or something uh german expressionist film or something uh has that ever been done hey there's an idea for a for a film uh german expressionist private eye black and white movie german expressionist noir has that ever been done um if so <laughs> let me know in the comments despite what i said earlier about how each book having a unique character and the benefits of the fact that they split these i personally always read them if i do reread them i reread them um quote simultaneously i'll sort of read a few pages of this one they break it up not only by the eight days but uh each chapter is broken up where it's sort of and of course not a single page that i flip to so like 8 a.m and then a couple pages later uh wait for it wait for it a couple pages later jeez pressure's really on when there's a camera here. and then a couple pages later 9 a.m and this book is set up the same way so you can sort of read a few pages read about 8 a.m in atlanta and then go here read a few pages about 8 a.m in new york um also there i guess the bad part of reading them that way is that there are certain scenes that are just too crucial to both books so they actually appear in both books so for example uh early example tachyon uh even though he's in atlanta for the convention he flies to new york city to to uh to attend the funeral of chrysalis and then walter john uh, uh, john joseph miller's character yeoman uh, also attends the funeral so they're both there um and we just see sort of the same essentially the same uh, proceedings uh from tachyon's point of view in this book and then from yeoman's point of view in this book and there and then there's uh, uh quite a quite a few scenes later in the book where jay Aykroyd, his investigation of the chrysalis murder takes him to atlanta where he kind of links up with tachyon and uh there's a good chunk of of material i mean it's got to be at least 50 pages of material that's recapitulated um you know that's shown from tachyon's point of view in the one book and then from jay Ackroyd's point of view in the other which makes you think you know because the manuscript the way it, it paced out in these paperbacks this one is about 385 pages this one's about 320 so i mean it, it would have been about 700 pages but then you you cut down on all those repeat scenes because you'd only have to show them once you, you'd probably be down to like 650 which doesn't really seem long at all, right? I mean, all the Game of Thrones books are longer than that, right? Uh, so it is kind of an amusing, amusing thing, I guess, just a, a sign of the times. Uh, and to be fair, I guess when I think about wild cards, I, I do think of them in this sort of paperback uh, pocketbook size. You know, they just that just feels like the right way to read these books is to read them in these in these smaller editions. Tor has kind of stopped doing that, I believe, at a certain point. I feel like Tor kind of eliminated this size and now it's it's always like these kind of gigantic trade paperback size which I guess to be fair I'm, I am getting older and so the bigger print is kind of nice um and yet just uh from a from a sensory perspective and a sort of tactile perspective these tinier ones always feel more they just feel more wild cards to me so what are you going to do I do have to it always has to be paperback though um I don't I don't necessarily like well I don't know to say I don't like it is maybe a little strong I mean it's just a book but um <laughs> whenever I do the uh, the hardcover readings of the books um uh, and they usually come out in hardcover first and so if I'm really anxious to read it I sort of got it right away get that hardcover and go to town but um that's my least favorite of all <laughs> is reading it in hardcover format I always definitely prefer paperback and usually this smaller one maybe one day uh i still think it might be interesting um well i don't know i still think it might be interesting to put these together into one you know 600 page book or whatever it would end up being in, in a larger size i'm not sure i guess it might 
go back to being longer, like 800 pages in that larger size. Uh, it still would be kind of cool to get an omnibus, but then again, it's fine. <laughs> I got my two copies. I pick one up, read a few pages, put it down, read this one. Uh, that works fine, too. So, um, and I, again, I can always make a fan edit myself, even though that would be maybe more trouble than it's worth. Well, here's an interesting thing uh, that came up um, that I that I was that I was that I was intrigued by watching uh, a recent. Um, I, I can link to this. I mentioned I've mentioned this before. Uh, some of these uh, online uh, seminars or, or sort of like online, I guess, online panels, uh, author discussions, um, and there was one recently hosted by Marianne Mahanraj that had David D. Levine. Living, um, and Walter John Williams discussing wild cards um, was part of was one of the features of that discussion. And there was there's just an interesting uh, tidbit. He didn't name the book, but Walter John Williams said that there was a book that he contributed. I think he said specifically it was one of the braided narratives, which really narrows it down because I think he only contributed to two of those, if I'm remembering right, uh, where he said that. Um, his character uh, was sort of, he appeared in a lot of scenes with other POV characters, and a lot of times it ended up being that the other character was the POV, or the other writer. So if it was a scene between Williams's character and the other one, written by someone else, it would be from the other person's point of view. Um, and so he felt like his POV character, a lot of his best scenes ended up being written by someone else. And he said that he got to a point where he was like, why am I even writing this one? It seems like my character is not important enough for me to be writing from his point of view. Because uh, all, all his most important and significant moments occur in a scene written by someone else. And I, I was trying to think. He didn't. That's all he said. And so uh, it's possible that it's one of the books that he didn't contribute to where, where they actually said, oh, okay, maybe you're right. And they cut his part. <laughs> out of the book. But if it's not that, <laughs> then it's either six or 11. I think those are the only ones, the braided narratives that have a Williams POV character. Um, and so, and I was thinking about what Golden Boy does over the course of volume six and kind of going, well, he doesn't, this may be a little spoilery, but he doesn't contribute too much to the climax. Um, a lot of the things that occur over the course of the book probably could have occurred in, in almost the same way without Golden Boy being involved <laughs> to some degree. Um, or as William said, in the ones in the ones where Golden Boy is pretty essential, someone else is there to sort of to to give the point of view. So if you know if he's if he manages to stop Mackie Messer from killing Sarah Morgenstern, well, Morgenstern is a POV character and so is Mackie Messer. So you've got already got two POV characters in the scene. And I think it is actually told largely from Mackie Messer's point of view, um, if I'm remembering right. Uh, although I think there is some Golden Boy POV in that se sequence as well. Same with when Golden Boy encounters Demise. Uh, similar thing where it's told from both both POVs, but you could have done the whole thing from Demise's point of view if you wanted. And and then in the big climax of the book, Golden Boy actually doesn't, doesn't do much um, in the big action climax. And so I thought, this has got to be the one he's talking about, and I'm sure of it. Um, and the reason that was so striking to me is because I, I genuinely, I was thinking about, um, I can't remember if I mentioned this when I was looking at volume three, but with some of these, these braided books where you've got, um, you can't really pick a favorite story because it's just one novel, you know, just with multiple authors. Um, so it's more like, uh, and this just speaks to that fan mentality. You don't have to pick a favorite anything, obviously. But if you were going to do oh, ranking your favorite stories or whatever, um, like in a, in a book where it is more in the anthology format, you could say, oh, these are the top five best stories in it, or the top three, or, or just the favorite, the single favorite. Um, so you could do that with the braided narratives of saying, okay, who's the MVP? Which character? Uh, I think I might have said something like this, because volume three, I really think it's Demise by Walton Simons, um, because Demise really... Um, a, his, his thread over the course of that book is just so incredibly entertaining, and in Volume 3, uh, the, the two different storylines going on, the, the Shadow Fist Mafia stuff and the Astronomer stuff, Demise is connected to both, and so he really helps to kind of thread the whole thing together. 
and make it feel more all of a piece. So I kind of picked Demise as my MVP. If I were to pick a, an MVP for six, I really do think it's Walter John Williams and Golden Boy. Um, so in a way, I was kind of, I was sort of, uh, bemused is the wrong word, I guess, but I almost felt like, oh, I, I, like, I kind of hate that Walter, Walter John Williams feels that way because, uh, because to me, it's like, oh, Golden Boy is the magic ingredient. Maybe partly because he's not so essential, and so he can sort of be the guy who's just seeing things more from the outside, maybe providing some color commentary, uh, and just giving the book some life beyond pure plot mechanics. And you know, like because um, there is sort of like a secret sauce, right? To when to a book you love, you know, it can't just be like, oh yeah, good, good, interesting characters, very clever plot. Um, you know, no plot holes. Uh, the theme was, it was thematically consistent. Uh, ergo, I loved it. There always has to be like some, some extra bit of personality, uh, you know, a little spice um, to really make a novel kind of stand out to a reader and be like, oh, this is one of the best books I've ever read. Like any favorite book that you have has to have something beyond just ticking the boxes. Um, and I think, I think really Golden Boy is that magic ingredient for this book. Uh, and, and the Walter John Williams prose is just so entertaining. Um, and uh, the character, the character's interior mon or inner monologue is, is fantastic. Um, plus, Golden Boy is one, of the f is one of the characters in the first book. And it's one of the best stories in the first book. And so uh, this, this one kind of, uh, it's, it's the last, it's the last Golden Boy story. I mean, it's not the last time he appears in the series as a character, but it's the last time we sort of are inside his head, um, where he's a lead. Uh, it's the, it's the, so it is kind of the bookend. It's the end of his arc that started in the first book. Um, so it does kind of create a nice bookend for the whole series. Um, but it is kind of the end of his journey in a way, as far as the character arc that is suggested by that first story. I mean, the first story has a pretty solid character arc on its own. Uh, and then Golden Boy comes back in volume four, written by Melinda Snodgrass. And uh, this feels like the end of the journey then. Um, if, you, if you look at Golden Boy's story being in one, four, and six, uh, you know, always, you know, the trilogy is always a good way to go, you know? So that's kind of the Golden Boy trilogy if you're looking at that, looking at it from that lens, you know, volume one, volume four, volume six. And uh, so, yeah, he is, he is kind of a screw up in the book, but that's kind of what makes him so cool. Um, you know, because on paper he's 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 the, potentially the Superman of the Wild Cards universe. You know, he was he was there in the '40s. He's ageless, so he's still around in the '80s. Uh, you know, fought the Nazis in World War II, um, or well, yeah, well, yeah, technically he did. Uh, that was before he got superpowers, but um, you know, but but fought fascism in the '40s, and uh, you know, has uh, at least Golden Age Superman powers, right? The strength, the bulletproof. Uh, the super strength being bulletproof and invulnerable. Um, but uh, in in sort of a perfectly quintessential wild cards twist, uh, he's just got these personal demons that entirely trip him up from ever really being the Superman of the wild cards universe, even though uh, looking look, looking at it purely from like the power stats of a role playing game, uh, he could totally be that guy. Um, and so in a way, even the fact that he is, in some ways a non-factor in the book, um, particularly in the climax where he doesn't actually get to accomplish all that much to, to stop the bad guys. Um, that just kind of fits the whole thing. That fits the whole theme with the guy. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and there's also, I, I, I'm pausing a lot, I think, because there's also a twist uh, with a certain character and, and Jack Braun, AKA Golden Boy is the guy who does solve this particular mystery that's again a very non-essential element of the book speaking in absolute terms um but it's part of the again part of the spice part of part of the secret sauce uh and it involves golden boy sort of discerning the true identity of this seemingly very insignificant side character um and that's one of the best parts of the book and so uh so i guess what i'm saying and I'm probably belaboring the point, which is probably uh, probably could be the title of this whole YouTube thing. Is uh, you could call it belaboring the point. 
because I probably do talk too much about each thing I want to say. But that said, uh, um, I guess all I want to say is, Walter, Mr. Williams, if you're listening, uh, Golden Boy is is the magic ingredient, the secret ingredient. Uh, the Golden Boy passages in this book are uh, friggin' great, uh, and they make the book one of the best in the series as far as I'm concerned. So if you've ever doubted... <laughs> This also this also assumes that I'm guessing right in terms of which one you were talking about, and maybe I wasn't, in which case it doesn't matter. But if I was, and if you really do feel that way, um, rest assured that uh, he is, a, I, I feel like those sequences with him are essential to the book. Um, so yeah, really good stuff. With only two characters in this one, picking an MVP is probably kind of pointless. Um, but, I mean, Jay Aykroyd is really a, such a fan favorite. Um, the wise cracking private eye, I mean... He's just such a great archetype. Um, if I haven't said it before when I mentioned Jay Aykroyd in Volume 3, uh, he's genuinely funny. I don't know, I feel like the sort of, if you, if you were to look at, um, well, maybe I'm wrong. Um, I just sort of have this notion that when, that if you were to look at, if you were to look at the general zeitgeist in, in terms of how George R. R. Martin sits there, um, it's like, <laughs> in terms of Game of Thrones, it's like he's the guy who writes the really violent, uh, intense stuff um i don't know how often they really talk about or or sex for that matter a lot of sex a lot of violence um etc cetera, etc cetera, and a lot of, and a lot of sweeping epic narrative and, and you know uh brilliantly uh brilliantly conceived you know uh, conflict and and maybe i've just missed it but i feel like i haven't seen a lot of commentary on how funny he is on how on how funny his comedic characters are um, although even though I'm sure that commentary must exist, um, but I'm always, I, I've always found it a really striking feature of particularly the Jay Aykroyd character, um, of just, uh, really beautifully conceived, like all his scenes are so beautifully put together, uh, in the sense that he creates these great, uh, straight characters for Jay Aykroyd to play against, uh, to feed him the straight lines, um, and then have Jay Aykroyd deliver his little wisecracks and funny comebacks and, and, really have it read very uh, organically. Um, oh man, Jay Aykroyd, he's so funny off the cuff. Like, how does he come up with that stuff so fast? It, it's a great little bit of sleight of hand where you almost forget that, well, it's a it's a book. <laughs> Martin could have spent hours coming up with that funny comeback. Um, it just feels very, it feels very fast and flip um, where you're just kind of marveling at this guy's quick wit uh, <laughs> and kind of forgetting about the fact that who knows how many revisions the book had. Or then again, maybe Martin just does write him real quick, and he actually is that quick-witted. He's a funny man, not Martin. And certainly with a, with a series like Wild Cards, uh, a lot of the same stuff that, that some of the maybe cliches about what Game of Thrones probably apply to Wild Cards, and that there is a lot of sex and violence and, and death and darkness and uh, tragedy. Those are sort of the, the key features of the major moments of the series. And so... I guess when you discuss the the books in more general terms, uh, you sort of can't help but focus on the darker elements and the and the more violent elements. Um, uh, so it can be easy to lose sight of the fact that the books are just like really fun. Um, the wild card books they're fun. They're often very funny. They're often very clever. Uh, you know, certain characters the more the more comedic characters demonstrate a lot of wit and um, uh, you know they're they're. It's not just all gloom and doom, uh, um, even though that's kind of the stuff that gets focused on, I suppose. And I suppose that's probably true even of stuff like uh, all that revisionist superhero stuff from the 80s, um, you know, wild cards being part of that zeitgeist that also included Dark Knight Returns and Watchmen. Um, both of those books, both of those comics have a lot of funny parts in them, too, that no one really no one really talks about when they talk about them. They're always like, oh, it's just this dark take on superheroes. Um so if I haven't said it before in my many meandering videos, um, it's probably worth saying that uh, uh, the books are, are also just really fun uh, and, you know, fun to read. A lot of characters that are just, uh, that just uh, uh, have a sense of wonder and uh, excitement or humor um, just as often as there are the uh, those dark, intense moments. So, so yeah, um, so overall... Um, these are two of my favorites. Yeah, I guess I guess we'll just. I was considering doing one book at a time with these two, talking a lot about six, 
getting done, moving on to seven, but uh, it seems like I, I, <laughs> I guess the choice was made for me because I ended up just kind of talking about both of them. Um, I do think uh, they are, I used to, when, when, when there would be discussions on online groups, when they, would, when they would ask, like, okay, so what's your one favorite book? Like, name your favorite. I would always kind of cheat and be like, well, uh, these two, <laughs> which were actually one book, and do read like one book if you do read them back to back. Um, so I'd always kind of cheat and say my favorite single book is these two books. Um, and I, I don't know if that's true anymore. There have been more books since that I've really loved. Um, I really love uh, Fort Freak, which is one of the, the, the post-relaunch tour books. Um, but certainly these always will have a special place in my heart. And obviously John, uh, who I really should give more shout outs to than I do. So here's another one, John. <laughs> Thanks for everything. Thanks for all the fish. Um, uh, because yeah, he's the one who, who received volume seven as a present and read it and loved it and, uh, eventually, uh, shared it with me and, uh, eventually bought the first six books and set us both down a path of wild cards complete ism. Um, <laughs> so for that reason, certainly volume seven, uh, has a special place in my heart. That's another thing I guess maybe worth saying about seven. Um, um, because there's always that question of like, is there a good jumping on point later if you don't want to read all 29 books or whatever? Uh, if you were to start with seven, uh, I have a, I have a true anecdotal case of my friend John who started with seven and found it a very satisfying read all on its own. Uh, and there's something to be said for that. I was sort of, sometimes I'll try to, when I look at this one, I try to view it through those eyes, like a young, a young 13 year old or 12 year old kind of reading this. Um, and having sort of every every single revelation, revelation, everything that Jay Ackroyd learns in this book, is the reader learning it too. If you if you do it that way, whereas if you've read the first six books, uh, sometimes you actually do know a little bit more than Jay Ackroyd at certain points because you're like, oh yeah, I remember what happened in that previous book, whereas Jay has yet to learn that. Um, so I can I can sort of imagine it being a pretty cool reading experience if this was your first one. It really would feel like. Uh, every single thing being a huge revelation. Um, so it is kind of cool to read that, to, to think about, think of it in those terms and then to go back and read the first six, uh, and you can see some of the seeds being planted for some of the revelations in volume seven. Um, interesting way to go about it. Uh, that said, I don't know that I'd actually recommend a first time reader starting with seven, just because, uh, uh, a lot of spoilers, <laughs> a lot of spoilers for the first six books. But then again, um, it is a great series. Um, it's a, it's one of those series that I think isn't really hurt by spoilers generally. Um, if anything, <laughs> I have a friend who, if he sees these videos, he's going to be, he's going to lord it over me because I used to always argue with him that spoilers were horrible. And he would always talk about how, uh, uh they actually are, they make things better. If you know how something's going to end, it, it actually makes the thing, makes the thing you're watching better if you know where it's going. And I, I, I fought with him about that a couple of times, but now I'm going to totally, I cringe just thinking about how much he's going to mock me if he sees this. Um, but it is true with wild cards. Uh, sometimes, yeah, if you know where they're going, if, if you know where the authors are going, it kind of enhances the experience because, um, because they plant so many seeds uh, early on. Um, and, and there's just, there's always so much going on and you don't always know which threads are going to be the most important. Or, or which ones are going to pay off right at the end of the book you're reading versus three books later. So uh, if you kind of know where things are going, it's it becomes much easier to track that stuff, which I guess is good. Um, I mean, I guess in a way that's a testament to a good series that um, it's not just all about the twist, where even if you know where the twist is going to be or what it is going to be, um, not only is the book still enjoyable, but it, it, it might actually even be more enjoyable. Um, so it's got to be a testament to, uh, to the quality of the series overall and the books overall. So I guess, uh, you know, uh, dealer's choice as it were <laughs> in terms of whether you want to be spoiled before you read these books. Certainly I'm sure there's, there's a lot of online spoilers you could get, um, if you wanted to be spoiled before going in, um, or if you wanted to read them out of order, I, sh I guess that would be the other, the other element. Uh, and you're worried uh, if I start with book 21. I might really love it, but it might make me want to read the first 20, and now I've probably been spoiled for a lot of those first 20. Um, you can kind of rest assured that, oh, no, um, it'll still be cool. <laughs> You'll still be all right. Um, you might even like them more that way.
all right so that's that's uh that's six and seven i guess that's 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 all i got to say right now i guess i mean if i want to keep this this series going for a while i probably shouldn't say every single thought i have about these books because i might want to come back and re-examine something um so that being the case i guess for now that's enough of a primer for six and seven for anyone who's who's maybe watching these videos as they read or whatever um there i've said my my piece on six and seven for now and uh if i think of more things that I want to blab about, <laughs> about the first seven books. I'll, I'll maybe come back to them, but for now, let's keep going forward. And next time, uh, I'll talk about uh, Volume 8, which is titled One-Eyed Jacks. Actually, you know what? I did. There's one other thing. <laughs> the other thing about, about Volumes 1 through 7 is that you could argue that they're... I guess it depends on how you want to break it up. Um, triads or quartets or whatever. But the, the first three books are considered a triad, and then the, they, uh, they always refer to the Puppet Man Quartet being four, five, six, and seven. So these two books do provide a lot of resolution. Um, but I, I've, I've found, like, whenever I read them, they really do feel like the climax, not just to the Puppet Man arc, but really to, to kind of the whole series up to that point. I kind of mentioned that this one, I mean, uh, it's the end of the Puppet Man story, at least the first Puppet Man story, I guess. And he first appeared in book one. It brings Golden Boy kind of full circle. He first appeared in book one. Uh, there's some there's some closure involving Tachyon and the Four Aces, which are from volume one. Um, so in a way, this is almost like the first seven books are sort of like the first saga in a way, the first season, or there's a lot of ways you could look at it, I suppose. Um, and then volume eight, when we get to it, uh, that one really does feel like the start of like a new thing. It's sort of like... Um, I've always felt that way and maybe maybe that's partly because of how I experienced the books because when I first read them as a kid I discovered them when the first seven existed and that was sort of the the canon it was like coming into the series this is what existed this this is wild cards and then when the eighth book came out I had already read the first seven and now it was like oh there's more <laughs> and so it, it created a different feeling in my in my mind and, and occupies a different space in my brain and maybe I just haven't dropped that, but I do feel like even even if you were to just read them as a series, I, I sort of feel like there's a real sense of a break between seven and eight. Like the first seven constitute an era. Like these, this is the first wave of wild cards. This is the original saga, um, and then volume eight is the start of something new and and kind of kind of different. Whether that's all in my head. Or, or whether that really uh, is an accurate way of, of framing them, um, I guess uh, feel free to comment on that on that notion because uh, you may disagree. Uh, but that's kind of how I feel about about those first seven. So um, even I, I even had a, I've had a couple friends who are kind of reading the books, and I I always kind of try to tell them, uh, you know, if if you're getting well, well I had one one guy uh, who I convinced on an online message board to read the books, and he was. I felt like I kind of got the sense he was kind of burning out. He sort of got real into him and was reading one right after the other. And as he was getting through six and seven, maybe his momentum was lagging. And I was like, get to the end of seven, because that's really like the satisfying ending to the first wave. Like, um, what's the what's the Marvel movie thing? Phase one, phase two. I guess that's another way of looking at it, right? Like it's one through seven are like wild cards, phase one. Um, I have another friend who I think is on volume six right now. And uh, I'm trying not to be too annoying as I'm like, oh, yeah, finish six and then right away read seven because it's set during the same time period. And, you know, and then if you want to take a wild cards break, you should. But, you know, power through, read six and seven right close to each other. I don't think I've convinced him. But um, <laughs> but uh, sometimes I proselytize a little too hard, I guess. <laughs> what can I say? Um, but... Uh, so yeah, I, I guess that's the other thing that it, that's worth saying about six and seven is that they are they're the climax to the Puppet Man arc, but then they're also the climax to and then the climax to the Team Elise uh, material. Um, they give very satisfying payoffs to a lot of that stuff, um, but they also kind of pay off stuff that is was kind of part of the brew all the way from the very first book, or you know, part of the mix. Um, so in that sense, they sort of feel like really like truly like the 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 season finale or, or even a series finale if if for whatever reason the books had stopped there it would it would still feel like a very satisfying seven book saga but there is more so now i think i'm done blabbing for the moment 
And on that note, we can say, okay, end of this episode, and next time we'll look at Volume 8, One-Eyed Jacks, which is the start of, <laughs> depending on depending on who whose altar you choose to worship at, Volume 8 is the start of Wild Cards Phase 2. So we'll look forward to that. And for now, we'll say goodbye. She doesn't have any class. She says, but what is it? I'm trying to visit with my pal Melinda Snodgrass. Shoot the breeze with Walter John Williams. Hang out with Howard Waldron. I've been smart and for George R.R. R. Martin, his characters have so much power. I like to go out dancing. My baby loves a bunch of authors. My heart's broken several places. Baby's just sitting there reading about aces.